Good afternoon, and welcome to this session. Thank you all for being here. Uh, see, one of CGD's board members is sitting here in the front row, Tony Frater. So let me say hello to him, and particularly and to thank all of you for taking the time to, to come. Oh, and, and there's David Gordon sitting there as well. Uh, let me just say one thing before turning it over to Charles Kenny, who's going to be uh, moderating this panel. And it is to say that uh, this is a topic uh, that we're going to be discussing today that is part of a broader program on technology and development that we are uh, launching uh, here at uh, CGD. And uh, it also feeds into the uh, work of the commission, which is the uh, right in the back there, the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, who are co-hosts uh, for this event, and of which, in fact, uh, Benu and Zulu is one of the two co-directors uh, uh, for the technical group. Uh, one thing is clear is that this topic uh, today we're going to focus on is how technology is likely to impact the future of work in developing countries, the future development model and how we think about it, the way in which traditionally we have seen developing countries move from agriculture to uh, relatively low-skill manufacturing and then up the ladder and into services. If that rung disappears because of some uh, advances in technology, what does it mean for the nature of development? And there's a topic on which there's a wide variety of views. There is a lot of disagreement, uh, in, even in the limited amount of work that has been done so far, you will find many, many different views, often different views by the same person expressed on different occasions. So I am really looking forward to some of those differences of views coming out in this conversation because I think at this stage in the debate, it's really important for us to be able to look at all the options before we come down on what seems to be a consensus going forward. So with that, let me hand it over to Charles and take it from there. Well, thank you, Ms. Eden. Thank you all for coming. You will uh, perhaps uh, notice this is uh, much like the field in general, which uh, is, is moving dramatically, uh, uh, changes every day. The, the same is true of the panel. Um, the, uh, we have a bigger, better panel than uh, previously advertised. And I'll, 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 I'll briefly introduce uh, the, the, the panelists um, as, as I ask them. Um, a first question. Um, but uh, thank you all for coming, and, and thank you um, in, in particular those of you who stepped in at the last minute. And before I make everybody uh, lose their hearing, it's a bit better, right? Um, so I'm going to start in the middle uh, uh, with, with, with Benno and Uli. Uh, Benno, uh, uh, as, as Masood mentioned, you are uh, co chair of the uh, uh, the, the, the Pathways for Prosperity, um, co-chair, uh, uh, co-director of the Pathways for Posterity, the Prosperity <laughs> Commission, pardon me. Um, but before that, you were uh, uh, the, the, the governor of the, the, the Central Bank of, of Tanzania. And I wanted to ask, from that point of view, um, the United States is, people in the US are, are terribly excited by the topic of, of, of robots um, taking our jobs and um, uh, this being a, a force behind, um, you know, everything from uh, uh, Trump's election to uh, uh, you know, the future prosperity of the country. Um, is this yet another case of donors, pretty much, taking their domestic concerns and internationalizing them and saying, ah, oh, well, if it's, this is our problem, this is your problem too? Um, or do you actually think that uh, uh, the issue of AI and robotics and what it means for um, uh, the potential pathways to, to prosperity uh, really is a global issue? Yeah, um, I, I definitely think it is a, a global issue. Um, and from the perspective uh, of the region I come from, uh, we have all been hoping that uh, uh, you know, the geese are flying uh, westwards from China and uh, Indonesia, and that uh, these are the geese of uh, manufacturing. And they would land 
uh, in Africa as the next destination. And now suddenly we hear about uh, all these uh, potential lost uh, opportunity uh, really to use an escalator that uh, both creates jobs at the same time raises productivity growth um, and did miracles in, in Asia. Um, so um, I think given that many of our countries are really now focused on industrialization and you read that across all countries, everybody wants to do industrialization. This is going to be definitely a shock and one needs to look at exactly how this is going to happen. There are two main concerns uh, that uh, I would like to put forward. Um, and this is really related to the cost of adjusting to this new situation. Um, one uh, type of cost um, relates to obsolescence. Um, you know, uh, our countries have undergone premature deindustrialization. So we do have some experience, right from the 70s until now, that uh, as a share of uh, GDP, as a share of employment, uh, manufacturing has actually declined, and we imported our, our way into deindustrialization. Um, now, um, the cost of obsolescence, in essence, uh, would relate to uh, industries being closed, and we have had experience uh, of uh, industries being closed, uh, and jobs are lost, uh, and that's the main, I think, uh, story that everybody talks about. But there's also a second story, which is lost investment. Um, uh, given that a good number of our countries had actually built these industries uh, with debt financing, uh, our national balance sheet is going to look different. Uh, we still retain the liability, but the assets have gone. And we get into a serious debt problem uh, in relation to uh, making sure that uh, uh, you know, we pay back, but without the benefit uh, exactly of this uh, uh, industries. Um, so this is definitely one, uh, one major um, concern that uh, um, uh, we have. The other costs are transitional um, in terms of adjusting to this new situation. Uh, the cost of upgrading uh, our industries uh, so that uh, uh, with new technology at least retain the value added, if not the jobs, and have the value added also uh, maybe through uh, backward linkages and, and, and other linkages on the forward uh, 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 side. Uh, the cost of retraining uh, in terms of getting skills, uh, which also uh, have to be managed in terms of uh, uh, transition. And finally, uh, I think we need really to think about what are the new drivers uh, that uh, you know we should be looking at. I know for sure in the region right now the uh, both um, resource uh, activities and services uh, have all increased in terms of share in GDP and employment. Um, these are the new growth drivers. Uh, for most of our countries, um, and uh, even in terms of uh, their productivity growth, certainly to increase the shares, they have been growing faster than uh, the, the, uh, the aggregate economy. So uh, what will it take for us actually to be able to do this? And finally, um, the cost of, uh, 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 if you want, uh, social protection safety nets. Uh, jobs are lost, and uh, one way or the other, uh, we need to see how we manage uh, uh, anxieties from those uh, losses. So who pays for it? I'll end with that. And hopefully there is a scheme uh, globally, uh, at least to tax uh, uh, the super profits coming from innovation, 
uh, that uh, can be used partly uh, to defray some of these costs. If you were a central bank governor still, couldn't you just print the money? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Mary, uh, um, uh, from, from the World Bank, and, 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 and thank you so much for, for, for joining the, the panel. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, a paper came out in Science Robotics uh, a couple of days ago, um, uh, and it uh, describes uh, the work of uh, a team of researchers who managed to program two robots to put together an IKEA chair. Um, it was a most impressive, the, the, the chair was called the Stefan. Um, uh, uh, they actually did manage, these two robots, to, to put the Stefan chair together. Um, it took them 20 minutes and there were two of them. Um, on the one hand, I mean, yay, finally somebody knows how to put together an Ikea chair. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, it, it did take them quite a while. There were two of them. There were big capital costs. There was, you know, 3D cameras, uh, the whole thing. And it was an Ikea chair. And I don't know the last time you made an Ikea chair, but the, the instructions are written so my three-year-old can understand them. Um, so, you know, I, I, it was hardly Skynet, put it that way. I, 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 was, uh, I, I, I was thinking that I'll still be actually putting together the Ikea chairs in my house for quite a while yet uh, at this rate. Um, you've just uh, uh, finished and published a, a, a fantastic book, uh, Tr Trouble in the Making, um, which suggests that you know may maybe I'm being um, a, a, a bit too sanguine uh, about my future in IKEA chair manufacture. Um, I mean, do you, do, you, do you think that, that, that automation is really going to take apart the manufacturing path to development uh, more broadly, uh, and if so, how rapidly? So one key thing to note, the, the title in the book, Trouble in the Making, has a question, question. mark, right? Um, and it was asked that, that way in part, um, sort of this disconnect off in the media is incredibly alarmist. Uh, I did a poll yesterday, so I'm actually personally just curious, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, so if, and I'm only giving you a binary choice, if you think, whether or not you think overall technology is going to be helping development, and reduce poverty, or whether on net technology is going to increase polarization or inequality, right? So you have to vote one way or the other. So who thinks that technology, and uh, put by 2030, is going to be helping uh, development and reduce inequality? Yeah. Okay, and who is worried it's going to increase it? Okay. Oh, okay. So yesterday it was even more lopsided to the to the optimists. So Stefan, who was the the chair yesterday, he was like, "Well, if you're in development, you're already an optimist." Um, but anyway, so I find it, I find it actually <laughs> quite, quite interesting. So what we did with this book was in part to go to the evidence and just sort of look a little bit more, what are the trends, why is technology potentially going to be different, and what, what does this mean in, in that sort of time frame, in roughly sort of a 10-year time frame. And there's a couple of different things, but one is sort of looking at it both from a technology point of view, like what can the robots do, uh, and looking at it from an economics point of view. And, and recognizing manufacturing is, an, in fact, a hugely diverse set of activities. And so being granular actually matters. Uh, so if you think about it from technology, there have been robots for a long time. They have been active in a number of sectors for a long time. So the sectors where the robots are most intensively used now, that's been true for probably at least 25, if not 30 years. So uh, automotive is number one, electronics, machinery. Uh, and the least is garments. Um, so things that bend and are stretchy and you have to curve and et cetera, robots are not good at that. So they're not sewing your kids' clothes or anything else uh, yet. Now they're obviously technologically trying to push on that. There are a couple of little bit of breakthroughs. But then there's a, a second piece, which is the economics, which you've hinted to, again, a huge capital investment to put together an IKEA chair. Uh, and costs are coming down, um, and the sophistication of robots are, are going up. But it's still at a place where you really need them in high value added activities where precision really matters. So medical devices is an area of growth in this area. Um, but a lot of lower value added goods at the moment, are you don't see anything like as much penetration into these activities. But I think what, what you're alluding to with the geese is a huge question. So in the United States or a lot of high income countries, a lot of the media hype is of the current jobs, how many are at risk of being lost? And then the numbers have ranged from 70, 80% down to 7 or 8%. So the methodology and assumptions behind it have huge variation. But I think for a lot of lower income countries that don't have a large manufacturing sector, the, the risk isn't 
the current jobs that may be lost, it's the geese that may never come. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that's the right <coughs> attention. Uh, and there are some patterns there that are changing. So the, the number one country predicted as of this year to have the most installed industrial robots is China. And so, you know, Japan has long had that, Germany, United States, but by far the biggest growth and the numbers are now in China. So this sort of model of really focusing on low cost labor uh, as China's own labor costs are rising may not be altogether the same, uh, the same pathway forward. Uh, but I think when, if you look at it across different subsectors in manufacturing, there are actually a lot of areas which it's still possible and is likely to remain possible for a good many years to compete and to have a path through uh, manufacturing to higher growth. On the other hand, I also think um, sort of this linear model of having to go from agriculture to manufacturing to services is outdated. And a lot of why you liked that manufacturing middle step was precisely what you were saying. It's this combination of productivity and jobs. And that combination is particularly powerful. Some of this technology threatens to split it. So you may get the productivity, but not the jobs. Um, but there are other areas where services act much more like what manufacturing traditionally has. So services are increasingly tradable, often through technology. Uh, there's a lot of um, productivity gains, uh, innovation, technology diffusion happening through services. The productivity, a lot of them are rising. As incomes rise, demand is rising. So I think there is a lot of scope for services. So I think there's both the alarmism of manufacturing is over, is overblown. Uh, and there's sort of opportunities in services. Um, so there are other pathways, I think, that, that can be leading to development. Thank you, Mary. Before we get to the more optimistic taste, I, I take, I want to uh, go back to your, your, your line about uh, geese never coming that you, uh, that, that you both mentioned. And uh, Vid Ramachandran, a colleague here at uh, CGD, um, who's done a lot of work on African firm productivity, you know, the, the geese weren't coming to Africa. Uh, they haven't been coming to Africa for a while. Um, uh, and maybe this problem is only going to get worse with, with AI and robotics. Given all of your work on, on Africa cost competitiveness in manufacturing, um, where do you see the near present and what do you think the impacts of robotics and AI, AI might do to the far present of, of, of manufacturing in Africa? Yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the question, the way I look at this question is uh, through, through trying to understand what the cost of labor is, particularly, because I, I do think that despite all of this um, hype about technology, uh, where manufacturing locates sim seems to be largely driven by how much labor costs, you know, with business environment issues and so on, governance and all that matter. But the, the cost of labor seems to drive a lot of this. And when we look at the cost of labor um, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are a number of countries that seem to have a much higher cost of labor in the formal sector compared to the large manufacturing locations, China, Bangladesh, uh, and so on. But there are some countries that look attractive um, and, you know, notably, Ethiopia has had quite a lot of success in attracting uh, what we think of as traditional manufacturing, garment assembly, light manufacturing. My, my sense is that this, this advantage may last for a little while for some countries. Um, and it may, in fact, generate some jobs in the manufacturing sector in, in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And I think we shouldn't let go of that too quickly or worry about robots too quickly. Uh, it is the case that for most low-skill um, manufacturing or, or, or uh, manufacturing in low-income countries, as Mary pointed out, we haven't seen uh, you know, a large-scale um, sort of advent of robots. We haven't seen technology take over a lot of the tasks that, uh, that traditional labor uh, is carrying out. So I feel like there's, there's at least some time uh, during which we will see uh, some scope for manufacturing in sub-countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that those are countries we need to uh, to, to look at and to figure out what the best environment is to sort of facilitate some of that manufacturing activity. I think the other thing that's going on that's interesting in, in the kind of more expensive countries and maybe the lower middle income countries is this blurring between manufacturing and services. You know, some manufacturing tasks are now kind of, uh, the, the line is blurring between, between uh, what it is exactly that the task is and whether it can be classified as a traditional manufacturing task or as a task in the, in the service sector. I think that's a very interesting trend to watch. And again, I think it creates 
you know, different types of tasks, new kinds of activities that we haven't thought about in this traditional manufacturing context. And again, I think there's a window there for some job generation, at least for a while, before we see you know, the sort of full takeover of robots that we're also worried about. Your, your point about manufacturing and services, I mean, you know, given that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa already services is by, by far the largest yes. economic sector as it is worldwide, um, uh, uh, and that more and more manufacturing uh, value added is in services, is a great moment to, to bring in uh, Kamal Bhattacharya uh, from, from, from Safaricom. Um, um, we are seeing really good quality services jobs appear in, in Africa, not least in Kenya, and not least driven by advances in ICT. Uh, are they going to appear fast enough and are there going to be enough of them to sort of replace uh, the, the manufacturing jobs that eventually may be lost to robots over time? Uh, <clears throat> well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I, mean, it's like, uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, we have to be careful to think of manufacturing, or, and I'm sorry, ICT and the advancements of ICT in general as a silver bullet for you know, any kind of new developments that are going to come up in, in developing markets. You know, I think we shouldn't have waited for the geese in the first place. Right? I mean, the, the, you know, sometimes I wonder if we're kind of pretending to be sort of the deer in the headlight. Right, because oh my God, they are not coming. It was it was in the making. I mean, as I think you just pointed out, you know, robotics and AI and all that. The hype is new, but it's been around for for decades. Um, automation has been implemented for decades. Um, we've seen the benefits of it. We've seen a lot of other things. I I think um, what what will make a difference and what is slowly making a difference is that we do realize, and I've seen this now at Safaricom as well, um, which you know, you're offering like a mobile money product that has almost 100% adoption to all households in a particular country. Um, it has had significant economic benefit you know, down to the individual household level. Uh, there is a very you know, and it, I always consider it as an experiment because there's still lots more to figure out how this is going to impact um, the, the society much more, much more depth than it's doing today. But funnily enough, we're just realizing that this is, you know, what traditionally people would call a big data problem. You know, and you think, like, we should have thought about this earlier, but, you know, the way how, how companies evolve you know, you, it's partly a technology issue because, you know, one other thing, um, you know, vendors in emerging markets love to sell to local companies all the stuff that's on the truck and nobody else is using anymore, right? So you kind of get locked in into all sorts of things until you realize, wait, this is not working anymore. You know, we actually have so much more information in our data. Um, and you look at what AI really is today, it's just, you know, new technologies or actually not even new technologies new techniques, somewhat new techniques that due to the accessibility of compute power can be used to just analyze much larger quantities of data and answer questions that were probably not accessible before. So we're now starting to see that I can now think about how to impact specific communities. I can now understand what particular needs are not just for a very small segment of the society, not necessarily through advertisement or you know, other kind of more frivolous ways of getting to that, but to truly understand what is driving economic growth in this particular community. The customers, on the other hand, and we sometimes you know, talk about this in a very, um, <laughs> in a very abstract way, and you know, even for me, I mean, this is the first time that I've ever worked in a company that is consumer centric. Um, I was always more on the vendor side of things and on the core technology side of things. And now I'm looking at it and I see, you know, our customers are expecting very different things. And this is not the middle class necessarily. These are people who have, you know, small shops in in sort of remote areas. They expect that you provide them 
you, you help them to reach their aspirations. That's a huge shift in thinking. And that's not just a mature market thing. It's, a, it's in our context, it's happening more and more. So what I think is the big opportunity um, to create more of these services jobs, but also to create maybe unique ways of thinking about manufacturing is to, to also develop the skills and the capacity um, to operate these technologies, to develop more of these technologies. And that's a private sector thing. At the end of the day, the government is not going to help me move towards big data. Nowhere. Right? It's not going to work in emerging economies either. It's the private sector, it's the entrepreneurs who have to take that leap of faith. And quite frankly, all of these things are becoming so cheap now. Right? I mean, uh, data analytics, deep data analytics, is becoming so accessible because of you know, cloud technologies. It's getting rapidly commoditized much faster than any other technology before. So I personally feel very optimistic, not because I technically don't work in development, right? I, you know, I work in R&D you know, in, in, in developing countries, and I've been doing this for the better part of the last decade. And what I find so exciting now is that I see the shift in the mindset of local companies, right? Uh, and not just you know larger companies like with Safaricom, but also smaller companies, startups who are like, we, we can now really start doing something different. And we're going to do something different. And this is our opportunity to redefine it. And if we build our own manufacturing places with maybe more affordable robots um, that don't create a single job in the factory, we will still improve the economy because we will need logistics. You know, we will need uh, bringing the supplies there. We probably at some point will even build some of the supplies ourselves. So there's, there's, I think, a tremendous opportunity. We kind of shot the geese. Right? <laughs> That's where I would like, uh, you know, that part of the, you know, my part of the world to to go towards. Uh, not the environmentally friendly answer. No, I, no, say, I know. I, I, <laughs> and I have never <laughs> shot an I'm animal in my life. Worried about just to make sure. Right. And now you're shooting <laughs> the right. animals for a heart. I'm not even much of a meat eater, so. <laughs> um, I, the, the, but the, the, the idea of shooting the geese, I, mean, um, um, I do want to hold, uh, hold on to a minute for the, for the idea of, um, in the part of the sort of manufacturing led uh, uh, path to development story is about exports, right? It's that um, you create an industry that is internationally competitive mm -hmm. and that drives up um, productivity in manufacturing, but also with spillover effects uh, 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 more, more widespread. Um, now, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, technologies, including uh, th those rolled out by Safaricom, theoretically allow for at least is, is much more in the way of services trade, which is where I want to uh, bring in uh, Hans Doctor from, from the, uh, uh, who's Director of uh, Sustainable Economic Development at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, from the Netherlands. Um, what's the role for global cooperation here and sort of thinking beyond aid for a minute, uh, in particular, what does this mean for global trade policy? Mm -hmm. if, if the way that uh, developing countries are, are, are going to um, grow rapidly, now it's probably more services based and maybe more around services exports. It's lovely having duty free, quota free for textiles, but it's not the answer anymore. I mean, do we have to sort of rethink our global models on how we help developing countries get onto a, 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 a faster track towards higher productivity? Yeah. No, thank you um, for that question. Um, I'm, I'm still with the birds. Um, so I, I was uh, thinking, you know, the geese left at some point uh, for uh, Africa for, for better pastures or wherever they go. Um, but, um, and they probably won't come back, but we might have flocks of hummingbirds coming back. Um, and, and that is exactly because of, of global trade. And, and you already see it happening that because of technology, because of the connectedness, uh, smaller, nimble uh, companies in Africa can really benefit from, from global markets and find, find their niches. And uh, um, I've seen quite a lot of those um, uh, uh, in my work in Africa. I mean, for example, there's a company 
in, in Ghana that uh, packages fruits for uh, supermarkets uh, in, in Western Europe, in the UK and in the Netherlands. And uh, it's, it's already packaged there uh, with the prices and the advertising of the countries uh, where it's going. And it's there next day. And they can respond to customer um, uh, requests and, and, and changing demands very rapidly because of, of, of um, you know, the connectivity through the internet that's very cheap. Um, and, um, and, and so that kind of companies now, um, uh, I think, really have the future. And um, in the past, uh, industrial development was, was high cost, also needed a strong government, needed a financial sector uh, to support it. But I think the future uh, of manufacturing is, is going to be much smaller and at much lower cost. Uh, so that creates new opportunities for Africa. Is Africa going to grab those opportunities? Also depends on, uh, on, on further changes in, 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 in governance. And, uh, um, and there, actually, technology can also help because we, we now see that, uh, that for example, in, in trade facilitation, um, you know, digital solutions can really facilitate the processing uh, of, of the paperwork. It can ensure that taxes are paid. Um, it creates much more uh, certainty uh, that goods will arrive on time. So um, uh, technology can also help governments uh, to, to deliver better services that then enable the private sector. So, yeah, I'm an optimist. I, I don't really work in development because we focus mainly on, on the private sector and investing in the private sector and, and also get a return there. But, but our focus is, of course, for economic development and, and uh, you know, inclusion equality. But we do it as much as poss possible with, with private sector models. And I think that is also a change in, in, in development policy and development focus. It's much more focused on, on creating opportunities to support individuals to, to realize their potential and um, uh, instead of working with governments and, and focusing on social um, services or education. Then lastly, uh, knowledge uh, and education uh, have also been transformed uh, in Africa uh, over the last years. Um, people have now a lot of access um, to information and if you're a specialist now working in a certain field, and you want to know the latest uh, way to, to repair something or to do something, you just go on YouTube and there's these instruction videos. And I've seen in many cases that people have learned about pest control or about making cocktails or about uh, repairing a car or uh, about servicing um, uh, uh, some, some specialized piece of equipment through this uh, access uh, to, uh, yeah, to, the, to the global knowledge base. So, I, I really think there's um, uh, going to be a lot of uh, transformation, a lot of opportunities. Is Africa going to, to catch that? Uh, that is still, still an open question. Um, but uh, industrialization will not be the big factories that we see in Asia. Uh, that's maybe already uh, about the end of it there. Uh, we will probably see much more um, specialized, uh, on-demand, very localized uh, manufacturing. And in that environment, uh, Africa can actually really um, catch that new wave and, uh, and and be at the forefront there. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I am now um, not opening it up to you all yet, uh, but demanding that uh, you who have all been very polite to each other start getting uh, ruder and interrupt. But um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the opening round of, uh, of, 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 of politeness should be over. Uh, <laughs> um, so, in order to sort of provoke a bit, um, you know, so far. I've, the, Yes, things are changing. Maybe not as not so fast as we think. Uh, uh, manufacturing may be going down a bit. There are still opportunities, especially for Ethiopia. Uh, uh, yes, there are new opportunities and services. There are new ways to make money locally in, in Africa. Sort of to to the the, the question posed uh, in the title of the event: um, Are we going to see what we saw in? India in the uh, uh, 1800s uh, when it came to textiles, that uh, uh, technology change you know, and, and the spinning jenny was fairly quickly understood worldwide, yet nonetheless technology change, the actual impact was a whole load of manufacturing jobs disappeared in India and moved to Lancashire. Um, and yes, it was great for the global economy, arguably uh, 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 great for Britain, but pretty darn lousy for India for quite a long time. Um, is it going to be like that again? I mean, it, are, we, are we seeing the possibility that, yes, Africa keeps some manufacturing um, uh, 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 industry, even grows some, but fewer jobs, a smaller percentage of global output, 
Um, you know, and actually this, this leads to more divergence uh, in economic outcomes, or is the story more positive? Good question. <laughs> well, answer it then, Vig. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'll take up the first crack, and I, I don't think I have anything particularly insightful to say, but um, there's no doubt that these disruptions are, can be very difficult. I mean, it's, it's been difficult in the US, that's well documented, you know, as changes have come, whether it be the lifting of tariffs on Chinese goods or some sort of technological disruption, we have seen jobs lost and that process has not been handled very well, despite the fact that we have assistance programs for, for job retraining or for relocation. Um, these things have not been used very much. The, the data seem to suggest that workers who lose their jobs are often not able to take advantage of these types of assistance. So there's no doubt that some of this stuff can be disruptive, particularly the short term. I think there was a story yesterday in the Wall Street Journal um, about the emerging rust belt in China, you know, of, of wages becoming so high that jobs are moving to other countries or other parts of China, um, leaving towns, uh, sort of ghost towns. Um, so I think there's no question that this stuff is disruptive. I mean, for us as, as policymakers or as regulators, the question is how can we mitigate the negative, um, you know, these disruptions as best we can. Uh, it, I, I think these, these changes are inevitable, whether they're driven by technology or by changes in trade regimes or external shocks. Um, you know, we do have to think about this question. So I think that's, it's a very good question. You say it's inevitable. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the difference with the US story is, um, uh, even though they didn't work terribly well, we have uh, yeah. uh, safety yeah. net mechanisms that yeah. work at the national yeah, yeah. level to deal with this yeah. problem. If this is about jobs moving mm -hmm. from yeah. uh, 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 Nairobi to uh, um, Miami, uh, we don't have welfare, we don't have compensating yeah. mechanisms there. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, if this is a problem, what do we do about it? I don't think there's a job going to move from Nairobi to Miami. I mean, we're talking about also advanced technologies as an example, right? Uh, see, one of the things, and I can, I can assure you of this because I moved from India to Germany to the US to India to Kenya. I spent a lot of my time on many different countries in Africa. And guess what I never had to sacrifice on? Access to technology. Like I could build the same things anywhere I was and there was nothing, absolutely nothing that prevented me from doing that as long as I had the internet. And guess what? We have the internet. I mean, you know, I, I mean, we, we have we have quite good internet actually in developing market, and it's it's only going to get better, right? I mean, yeah, sure, is it some? So so <laughs> what I'm looking at is, you know, uh, some of these jobs may go away and or you know or never come. Quite frankly, I mean, it's of course the emerging markets is a is a is a vast space, but at least from my uh, sort of regional perspective of East Africa, uh, you know, the, the losing jobs to the mature markets is the least of my concerns. My concern is, can we capitalize on the opportunities that we have quickly enough? And that's always been my concern because, and I don't know whether it's, you know, it's, opportunities that are kind of linear in the broader context or if we are looking for some things that are leapfrogging or non-linear. Um, but I think the question to me becomes, can we do it quickly enough? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a, you know, we set up Safaricom Alpha, which is our innovation center. It's about, you know, 40, 50 people, all, you know, Kenyan local developers and all that. Look, they're building things. They're working on big data in the same way as anyone in the U.S. Um, they're working on, you know, advanced technology solutions, just like anywhere else. And guess what? They, where they get help from, like using the same medium, uh, like Stack Overflow and GitHub and God knows, like anyone else. So when I go to work. Do I see a difference to when I go to when I used to go to work in the United States? Quite frankly, I don't. Right? So, you know, are they the PhDs that you would get here and you know from Stanford and all that? Uh, no, but I'm not so sure 
that's a limiting factor either, right? So we can, th there's an opportunity to create the industries that we need to generate jobs. And because it's not going to be those developers, right? How many programmers do you need? Not everyone is going to program. But develop these industries by supporting entrepreneurship in the right way to create an environment where it becomes easier um, to develop new concepts, bring them out into the markets, and just try it out and generate jobs. That latter part, I think, is, is <clears throat> part of the discussion that, to me, is really lacking. Right, because, quite frankly, we don't have the environment to drive more entrepreneurship in a more aggressive way. We don't have the finance tools, um, financial tools, to support entrepreneurs much more aggressively than what we are doing today. That's a reality, and that is going to inhibit growth. So uh, you mentioned f uh, finance as uh, a barrier, and intriguingly, you, you play down what we often hear would be the barrier, which is skills. Um, uh, you don't need a Stanford PhD. There are probably some in the room. You can leave now. Uh, uh, I mean, is that? Do you, do you all agree that? I mean, the, the, uh, uh, that, that actually, uh, for all we hear, this talk of oh no, what you need in this environment uh, is 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 about stronger skills base. Actually, the problem is, you know, we need a better working uh, uh, financing system for entrepreneurs and. That is probably the major barrier. Sorry, am I misquoting you? Or? No, I, I didn't also, uh, the same way as I have nothing against geese, I have nothing against Stanford PhDs. <laughs> 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 <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah, uh, I think quite a number of these countries have, have been going through the process of adjusting to losing manufacturing. Uh, yeah. You look at the data uh, in Africa over the last uh, three decades, you know, as a share of uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, sorry, as a share of value added, manufacturing used to be somewhere in the range of 13 to 14. It went all the way down to mm -hmm. about six, seven. Mm -hmm. uh, as a proportion of employment, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite small. Mm -hmm because majority of uh, people there would be in the rural areas. They are uh, getting their livelihood from uh, agriculture and, and small and medium uh, and informal set of activities. So the extent of the adjustment, unlike, let's say, if it happens today in China, mm -hmm. where you are talking about 25 to 30%, uh, ratios, uh, the magnitude is simply much, much smaller in a number of these other countries. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a particular story. It could have been uh, by coincidence. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, we had a good number of uh, public enterprises that uh, yeah. actually were set up to run industries uh, with uh, loans from the World Bank, the Morogoro Shoe and the others. Right? Uh, and suddenly, all those came to a ground, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to a halt. Uh, and the question was, how do we deal with continuing to service uh, World Bank debt while these things are not operating? So nothing from the income revenue stream side, but you still had the cost. You know, came hippie. Virtually all those, all those debts actually were forgiven. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, if we do have similar situations as we go, mm -hmm. there has got to be some kind of arrangement that one has got to deal with the, the debt distress that's likely going to be there. It's not going to be much more on that because a lot of it is private now uh, in terms of private investment. So other people would have uh, lost. All that I'm saying is that um, these adjustment costs have to be borne. Uh, they may not be as large 
uh, in the countries where we were waiting for the geese to land. But what I fear more about is what's going to happen in Asia, where these numbers are much, much bigger. Yeah. And somehow we don't talk much about that part because they haven't uh, gone over the hump yet in terms of the inverted U's, still on the rise. Uh, but once they turn the corner, uh, I don't know what's going to actually uh, happen. This rust belt that uh, uh, have been mentioned. So I'm, I'm putting a question also to my colleagues. What's the likely scenario in China yeah. and other places? But, but China actually has turned the corner. So oh, okay. it's, it's now in the camp of the deindustrializing. Okay. Yeah. Um, for okay. about four or five years, and in employment too. But their their working age population is now declining, given their family planning policy. So they actually see robot there. That's part of the motivation in putting because there's a lot of government um, support behind this mm -hmm. uh, automation drive, uh, precisely in, in part because they see skills gaps and labor gaps potentially coming. Um, so the they see they see some of that. Um, I mean, I think they think it's strategically also really important to be involved and to be trendsetters and standard setters in certain sectors, and so they're making a big push on that. I, I'm actually wanting to sort of follow up a little bit on what on the you can't do it quickly enough kind of theme, because some of the industrialization and, and adjustment is a little bit different. The the nature of some of the competition. So some of Africa's earlier industri industrialization had a fairly large role for the government in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the adjustment has come in being more open to international markets mm -hmm. and some of the competition and not being able to quite keep up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that sort of skill of really being entrepreneur and, and quick and uh, being able to sort of respond and build a new <laughs> enterprise um, there, there, sort of, there's different kinds of things at work here. So on the one hand, the different kinds of skills. On the one hand, some of the technology in your phone and the apps on your phone take care of a range of skills you, you don't have to have, right? You don't need to be an accountant. You can plug your things in and your app will spit out all kinds of reports for you. Uh, you can keep track of all kinds of records electronically. You can show to banks and to customers. There's some skills you don't, more technical skills, some of which can be automated um, and changing it. But the, the competition on some of this is quite intense. And, and this is something that's different ways of playing it out. Because on the one hand, the barriers to enter as an entrepreneur are, are lower. You don't need the same capital investment. Uh, you can use, you have access to cloud computing. You don't need the same investments in, it depends on your business, but in, in servers. You can 3D print prototypes. You don't need to have built the whole assembly line. So some of the entry costs are much yeah. lower. Um, the competition is also potentially a lot more intense. If everybody else can enter more quickly, there's lots of you, and how do you distinguish mm -hmm. yourselves? And this is, you know, the platforms, uh, the Alibabas or the Amazons or the Ebays or the things, on the one hand, they have millions of people that are selling, but I'm sure whenever you do a search, you hardly ever go to the second page, right? So you really go to the top. So those algorithms, and whether you as an SME or a, an entrepreneur ever make it up there so somebody sees you, is really hard. So the number on Alibaba that never get a hit is is the vast majority, right? So yes, they have an impressive number, but the vast majority are not active and never have been, never got that first break. And so in some sense, this competition becomes very self-reinforcing. There's a lot of network effects on this. And it's not just the Google huge, huge network. But if you never get that hit, you never get the second hit. And then you, ne you know, getting, taking off is really hard. Is that a reason for industrial policy? I mean, if you look at, uh, I'm sorry, we are. Uh, I will stop abusing the power of a chair. Last question. Um, uh, 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 is that a reason for industrial policy? Because if you look at where the big internet companies are, they are, I exaggerate, but in California and behind the Chinese firewall. Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of the world has SAP. But the question is, will it be, will it remain uh, there? Uh, will that, uh, I, I think that'll change. You already see it happening. Uh, there's now also talk like, okay, uh, because the, the big monopolies, uh, is, it, is it wise to have such a big monopoly or such a big concentration? So you see that happening. But I, I, I want to pick up on the point of the lower entry costs. I think, and that will also, the lower entry costs will make it easier uh, to start competing. Mm -hmm. Can you compete also depends on changing <laughs> patterns of trade. If, you, if it's easier to produce uh, entry costs for production locally, you can also make more what your clients want. 
So that will change the patterns, of, and you can make it locally, and that will change patterns of, uh, of trade. So I think those big trade routes that we have now from Asia to, to the rest of the world may not continue like that. And, and trade will, uh, will probably become much more regional because of uh, technological mm -hmm. advances. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also uh, the other issue that will really narrow the gap for Africa is, is also artificial intelligence, uh, as you were saying. There's uh, a lot of skills also for, for governments that are sometimes struggling to regulate or supervise or whatever. They can also benefit from this kind of um, uh, 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 technology yeah. to, to govern more effectively with less people and with less uh, uh, skills um, uh, necessary. So it, it, it really changed the picture of competitiveness and, um, and, and local patterns of trade will change. Um, will Africa grab that opportunity? That is still up for grabs. I mean, the future never happens as predicted. And, and I have abused way too long, Carl. Thank you very much. It's, it's fascinating, the discussion, very complex. Um, the technology has many, many uh, cross elements in the book, dialogue. Very positive things and also some very negative things. But if you think about Africa, there are some special additional challenges. And I want to just highlight one. I mean, industry may be a very small share, so the disruption transition costs may not be so hard. The bigger problem would be that things that don't, don't come. But the bigger problem is the tremendous increase in the labor force. How are they going to be employed productively? And if the old avenue of manufacturing-led growth is not there, and if also China is mm -hmm. occupying manufacturing mm -hmm. and moving very quickly to have the commanding heights and all the high tech mm -hmm. and doing robotics, that's even less feasible. So you have lots of people in the rural sectors. Technology can help them, but how are you going to be able to create the livelihoods for these people. I think that's the big development challenge. And I think technology can help some of those things. It can do a lot on the social welfare side. Mm -hmm. We need to sort of push that mm -hmm. and see how they can mm -hmm. But coming back to taking advantage of these opportunities, the environment is very difficult. And when you have a structural thing like the population explosion, which is a, a time bomb, really, which can cause a lot of disruption, how are we going to deal with that? And I don't see any creative thinking. I, I think we all have to look for this conclusion. I wondered what sort of positive perspectives you can have and how to address providing productive employment for such a large growing population. More moderators, I say. Um, <laughs> let's take a couple more and then right there. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Virginia. Little John with Quantum Leaps. I wanted to follow up on your question, Kamal, about the need for financing for entrepreneurial opportunities in developing countries. I am chairing the women's entrepreneurial issue for the women's 20 of the G20. And this is one of the issues we're quite interested in. I wondered if you or any of the other panelists had thoughts about new financial models that don't exist, exist yet or aren't very well known yet. Recently, you know, we've had crowdfunding, we've had fintech, uh, blockchain, et cetera. Are there any that you think are highly relevant for entrepreneurship that most people don't know much about yet? And one more, and then we'll do a second round in a minute. Yeah, uh, Dominic Hazen with the World Bank. Um, I'm wondering if, while waiting for the geese, we're ignoring the flamingos. Uh, um, most economies in Africa are based on agriculture, and wastage in agriculture is phenomenal. Uh, also, transportation costs are incredibly high in Africa, and if we brought technology to bear on just those two issues, I think the economic benefit could be uh, quite, quite, quite large. Thank you. There, there will be a prize. We, we, we have uh, flamingos, geese, uh, hummingbirds <laughs> on the table. You know, if you can manage to get robins or something. Anyway, uh, so we had uh, uh, flamingos. Um, we had the, the, the question of you know, what are people going to do? There are uh, 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 demographic change. Uh, Africa in particular is in the middle of a, a, a demographic bubble. There are a lot of jobs needed. Where, 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 what are going to happen with them? And then the, the question about uh, new financial models. I, who wants to go first? Hey, maybe. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. All right, so I, I will answer flamingos. Um, because I think that's actually really important. And, and I think just even the phrasing of sitting here waiting for the geese. Like, what kind of development model is that, right? Yeah. So, no, there has to be sort of more sense of urgency in that there are things to do and there are things happening now to be excited about and to, to lift up. 
Um, and I and I and one point to sort of take it is it is true that within the sort of big global value chains, Africa is not a big. No, none of the countries in Africa are particularly big players. Um, but there's increasing trade regionally within within mm -hmm. the continent, and that that's really important. And again, it depends on these different kinds of subsectors. But food and agro processing, food processing is certainly mm -hmm. one of the ones. Um, increasing the amount of processing of natural resources more broadly is something that is expanding in the region. The local tastes and customization, mm -hmm. those are sectors where mm -hmm. this is you know, perfectly designed for that. But you also hit on transportation and how expensive that is. And the, maybe, Vidge, you were talking about the increasing importance of services, yeah. both on their own, but the increasing yeah. blurringness between manufacturing and services, and the input of services to make manufacturing successful. And so that can be design in R&D on, on sort of the input, but it's, it's distribution and logistics and transportation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if these services are increasingly important, that is an area where the region does, and again, there's difference across countries, is a, is a challenge. And really looking at some of those key input services that have much broader impact across a range of other sectors' ability to really be productive mm -hmm. too is, gonna, is a really important agenda uh, that countries really could be tackling mm -hmm. now and mm -hmm. to make more of, of their flamingos. Mm. Yeah, it, I, I was just thinking, um, so just to answer your question on uh, alternative fi financing models, um, we, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't have an answer to that. Um, see, when we look at, so first of all, I think part of, the market failures that we have today in the financing model, uh, especially in, in Africa as compared to, for example, in India. Uh, in India, we are now seeing a significant increase in local investors, people who have made their money, who are focused on India, uh, plus, of course, with the huge diaspora, uh, especially in the Silicon Valley and other places, um, who have made money, they are also pouring money back into the country that um, plus have the right kind of relationships, um, that helps a lot. Uh, in Africa, we just don't have that. Um, so there is an issue in terms of to what extent are local investors ready uh, to not <coughs> invest into real estate, which will guarantee you 15% you know, plus return, and you just sit on it. Um, versus investing into, for example, tech businesses, or you know, also just sort of low-tech businesses or you know, uh, local manufacturing businesses or whatever um, you know, is coming up there. Um, so the disparity you know, because of this is, is twofold. First of all, of course, you have, um, I think women in these spaces are significantly disadvantaged. There is nothing that gives me any indication that that's not true. Uh, secondly, also, um, it uh, you know it always makes good to have a male white founder anywhere in the world, also in Africa. So we also see the similar kind of biases that we see um, both in the United States as well as um, in many emerging economies, especially in Africa. Um, uh, there, there is lots more work to be done both on the entrepreneurial side to say, well, you know, if I want to get access to finance, you know, what are the right mechanisms? What, what is it, you know, how do I prepare myself to be able to impress somebody? Um, as well as, uh, in term, you know, in the context of traditional financing models. In sort of new and upcoming financing models, such as, you know, crowdfunding and others, you know, the, the, the African version or the Indian version of Kickstarter, um, Look, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, entrepreneurs uh, in those regions have to decide that for themselves. The money is there, right? It's not really a lack of fund. I mean, there is sufficient wealth in Africa as well. Um, the question is, are people ready um, to, to take this as an incredible investment opportunity that it actually is? I mean, you know, at Safaricom, we had an investment fund uh, last year, which I put to hold right now just to evaluate how this is going. And if I just look at uh, investments into local entrepreneurs um, in Kenya, the returns are significant. I mean, they're amazing. 
even just after a year after that we've made the investments, we are just evaluating this. Uh, it's, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity um, for local companies, local investors to go into this. And I just want to add to this one more point, um, which kind of cuts across the other two questions. You know what I think one of the other big market failures that we have in places like Africa and somewhat it is changing in India, and I think uh, the reason why China is getting to the point where it is, is because um, they're investing into R&D locally. It's 30% uh, government versus 70% in, in, uh, in China. It's about 34% private sector investments in India already. Um, and in Africa, it's like somewhere around 5%. You know, I consider, as at least in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I probably run one of the few R&D investments that a local company has made. And if I look at this as a percentage of total <coughs> revenue, it's still very, very small, right? Um, and, and, and I think, to your point, um, what are all the people going to do? I come back to that sense of urgency perspective, right? Um, if local companies, local investors, from the private sector perspective, don't engage more aggressively we will still be staring at the horizon and wait for the geese. And I already shot them, so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just to, uh, to add to this, uh, a couple of uh, observations. One, I think technology is already uh, creating new opportunities uh, in the way uh, you know, logistics are getting improved and value chains. Uh, are now developing, I'm talking about domestic value chains, let alone linking to the rest of the world, and also regional uh, 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 value chains. Um, we had focused too much simply on infrastructure, get transport, get connection, but not organizing flow of goods through the value chains. And logistics is one of the missing, I think, uh, uh, solutions uh, that uh, the region uh, has. Secondly, I think on the credit side, um, with FinTech, there are a whole range of new solutions that are just emerging, um, including, uh, you know, uh, screening uh, for credit in terms of microcredit, uh, credit scoring using data from utilization of mobile phone and uh, mobile money. Uh, it has now actually opened doors uh, really to those that before they couldn't even be thought of. Uh, and it has also removed the need for collateral, which is very expensive. Uh, so I think technology is creating these opportunities to answer some of those questions. And maybe we should look at uh, what we could harvest from that quant uh, point of view. We have time for one more quick question. I'm sorry for. Thank you. As, a, as you guys have spoken about the increasing penetration of technology into the African continent and other developing areas, uh, one thing that hasn't really been addressed is uh, uh, cybersecurity and, and the potential risk that this technology poses to individuals. Do you think that developing countries are prepared for the technological risks that these new capacities will, will create? Yeah, the, it's, the, it's the world. Uh, anybody. I mean, it's a, it's a big issue, not just in developing countries, also in our countries. I mean, a lot of people are concerned in this country uh, about the security of their, of their data and, uh, and personal lives and, uh, and, and what it does to politics. And, so this is definitely an issue that, that, that needs to be solved. But uh, I, 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 I think it, in, in the end of the day, it creates more opportunities. We, we yeah. see it with health data, for example. We, we are uh, funding a very interesting initiative called CarePay that is um, trying to use the value of, of patients' data in, in Africa to use it for the benefit of the patients, to monetize it and, 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 and see it as a, as a component in an insurance product. And I think th those things are, are, are more exciting and ultimately have more benefits than, than the risks, which need to be dealt with as well. But, uh, but, but the, the flip side of, so not just the cybersecurity, but just even the amount of information about us that's out there that's being shared 
you know, you may share some information for this purpose and then use it for another. And, and, and I guess what I worry about precisely are insurance markets are not going to work as insurance markets anymore. Mm -hmm. So if information is out there about my health or, you know, if this facial recognition can actually get to the retina of my eye and be able to tell all kinds of predictive health things for me such that I now can't get a car loan because I may not, or a mortgage or anything else because I'm now a health risk, um, or I can't get health insurance at all. So obviously countries that have universal coverage or there's no pre-existing conditions, fine, but if you don't have that, there's all kinds of potential unintended consequences that may come out, or the kinds of price discrimination that can happen, you know, um, so all your consumer surplus will be happily taken up by the people who know what you're willing to pay. I mean, there's a, there's a range of unintended consequences, some more worrying than others, that I, I don't think any country has really thought through. And it takes a different kind of skill, including on the regulator's part, um, to know what the right rules are and to know how to enforce it. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes technology can help with the enforcement, sometimes it can help with evasion. So I, I think we're, we're, in, um, we're not in great shape on that one. I think one interesting example of what's happening right now in terms of, of, of cybersecurity and data sharing is the Indian experiment with biometric ID. Mm. So, you know, Aadhaar has been very widely adopted and it has had tremendous benefits in terms of service delivery, but the sharing of the data has resulted in a, a whole range of issues around security, around privacy, around, you know, who has the right to your information. And it, it has become a very critical issue in India now, and it may well um, set back the program uh, as the courts you know, start to adjudicate on this. So that is a, an, an interesting set of events that I think people really didn't sort of think through you know, upfront that it's now become a very critical uh, sort of turning point for, for identification and for service delivery. Thank you. Um, that was one thing technology allows is just in time uh, uh, creation of panels. Um, and thank you particularly to, to, to those of you who uh, uh, stepped in the last minute. I certainly uh, learned a lot and found uh, in particular that last exchange Fascinating. Um, this being the, the week of the World Bank uh, IMF annual meetings, I think we did spring meetings. We have to have at least one or two takeaways for the uh, bank and the IMF. Uh, one was Benno's suggestion that we're about to have HIPIC 2, which I found uh, <laughs> exciting. Um, you heard it here first. And the other one is clearly the bank needs a, uh, an avian economics department. Um, <laughs> birds are the future. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Sorry there wasn't more time for discussion, um, uh, but hopefully you can take some time out back to continue the conversation. Thanks. Thank you.